right now. So it's heart of the uh, container conf. And for this keynote, we uh, invited someone who has um, a long record of experience with containerization, someone who has founded a company dedicated to um, services around containerization, uh, consultancy and development. I'm talking about Container Solution and its CEO, Jamie Dobson. He will be talking about strategy in ancient days and today. Jamie, next second. Thank you. Um, <coughs> good afternoon, everybody. It's really nice to be here. A uh, couple of things before we start. I wanted to extend my gratitude to uh, Rene, Karina, and Julia, who have organized this conference. Um, the, I think it's been outstanding as a speaker. The organization's been excellent. So thank you, and I think a round of applause. Another thing I'd like to point out for no particular reason other than I think it's funny. Uh, I came here about 20 minutes ago to set up just to make sure everything was nice. This Windows laptop decided to update itself. It's still updating. <laughs> so we'll leave it there and see how long it takes to complete. Um, okay, so as Renny says, I work for a company called Container Solutions and we've been very busy um, helping companies and vendors, clients of ours to succeed with containerization. Typically, the companies who do succeed treat containerization, the introduction of you know, programmable infrastructure, distributed systems, they treat it as a strategic change. The ones who don't succeed treat it as a tactical, localized change. So what I'd like to do today is speak about strategy. Strategy itself, is a, as a word, has been so used and abused, it's almost become devoid of meaning. It's generally hated in the world, and it's even more hated by people in tech. I always say it's because strategy sounds a little bit like bullshit. And tech, tech people and engineers are a bit allergic to bullshit. Now, the reason we need strategy when we're thinking about programmable infra containerization is because of three real reasons. Containerization spans organizational boundaries. It's not something that has to do with development, and it's not something that's to do with operations, but it's something to do with everything. Almost certainly, companies who begin to introduce containers don't have the capabilities to deal with them. Because it's an adaptive, positive change, there are likely to be winners and losers within an organization. Where you have winners and losers, you have resistance. That's the central paradox of strategy. What's good for an organization as a whole could be very bad for some of the individuals in it. And unless we learn how to overcome these, this paradox, this core paradox, we're never going to get anywhere with the work we've been trying to do. A lot of the work we're doing right now is complex. Does anybody get a feeling that you know, orchestration, microservices, schedulers feels complex by being here the last couple of days? Does anybody think it's simple? Is everybody awake after lunch? <laughs> okay, good. Uh, I thought the Windows joke would get everybody awake. Aha, Windows. It's like, okay, I have been dining out, dining out on Windows jokes for like 20 years. Um, poor, poor Windows. Uh, okay, so strategy, the pathway through paradox. We have to start this story like all good stories, not in modern times, but every time I do a talk, this happens. Just have to get a bit closer. I think it's the Windows machine. I think it's put a force field around uh, my Mac. Well, let's try that again. Oh, okay, I'll just press that button. Oh, that doesn't work either. Just <laughs> give me, ah, okay. So every, uh, oh, we're back, we're back. We, we have to go back in time to, uh, in this case, ancient Greece. The story of uh, Odysseus, or Ulysses, if you prefer the Roman version, he fought in the Battle of Troy before leaving to, to make his return journey back to Ithaca, where his kingdom and his wife and his children were waiting. Of course, what did he do? He did something stupid. He cursed the gods, and uh, as revenge, Poseidon blew him off course. And thus began a series of, of adventures as Ulysses made his way all the way back to Ithaca. 
It took him about 10 years. Now, I don't know if the Mediterranean was bigger in those days, and I don't know what he was doing, but it basically took him 10 years to get from one side of the Med to the other. This particular story, from the image you see on the screen, is the story of the sirens. The sirens were beautiful enchantresses. They sang wonderfully well. In fact, they sang so well, they would attract uh, passing sailors who would then steer the ships towards the sirens to hear the music and then shipwreck themselves and die. Hence all the, the dead bodies and the carcasses. I often wondered, did the sirens eat the sailors? I don't really know what happens once they crashed. Uh, maybe somebody can check on Wikipedia for me. I like the story because in the story of Ulysses are all the seeds of strategy. There's a goal, in this case, to visit the sirens. It's built into a larger narrative. He's actually trying to get home to Ithaca, and there's lots of stories along the way. There's an understanding from Ulysses of the situation, what we would call situational awareness. He knows there's danger, therefore there's risk, and therefore he, you know, there's some courage required. And he needs to overcome the obstacles. How is he going to listen to them to satisfy his curiosity without getting killed? The solution they came up with was to take a cloth and wax and put it in the ears of his crew. And then Ulysses got tied to the mast and then they sailed past. And that's how he did it. Um, and he said, under no circumstances, you know, should you untie me. So this is what you see in the story of Ulysses. One of the most important things is this, this idea of self-supporting actions. Now, it may seem rudimentary, but we visited at Container Solutions lots of customers with excellent operations teams. You know, they run their ships well, as it were. Uh, they do a very good job of automation, high availability. In the same organisations, you might have excellent development teams. You know, continuous integration, continuous delivery, low defect counts, both doing an excellent job. But if the processes that connect those two groups and the tooling that they use are disparate, they'll actually underperform less uh, organized teams that are better connected. If, you, if Ulysses is going to fight the Minotaur on Crete, he shouldn't put wax in his ears. So local actions that make sense in a local context don't make sense in a global context. So strategy is certainly to do with self-supporting actions. Um, it's also to do with the present moment. The question, the key strategic question should always be, what's going on here? What's happening right now? It's not necessarily about the future. It's certainly about future states, where should we go next? But it's not about some dreamy, airy-fairy vision of a utopia. It's about the current situation you're in. Now, there's something missing from this story. Uh, okay, there's something missing from the story and to fill the gap, we sort of jump forward in time now to 1940s um, uh, Scandinavia and Sweden. The, the guy who started IKEA, he had a dream or vision. He wanted to create you know, you know, price competitive furniture for people in Sweden. The problem is he started to squeeze the prices for, of his suppliers and they didn't like that. So they basically boycotted working with IKEA. Now, classic strategy. There's a problem, there's some adversity. The IKEA team flipped the adversity into an opportunity and they found people in Poland who were willing to produce the furniture to supply to IKEA. However, this also classic strategy, the solution created an immediate problem. How do we get the stuff back from Poland? And thus began IKEA's innovation around flat packing. Fast forward from the 1940s and 50s, you get to the 1970s. There was a change in VAT. I don't know what VAT is in German. Value added tax. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, excellent. Why, do, why does everything in German sound scary? <laughs> it's like, why do you do the terrifying language? Uh, okay. So, value added tax. Now, I. Swedish people will be like Germans and the English. They don't want to waste money. So there'll be there's lots of people in families across Sweden asking each other, hey, how can we spend our savings before VAT goes up? Let's buy some furniture. Good idea. Now, poor IKEA were completely inundated with coupons and requests for furniture. At the time, it was a mail order company. There were no shops. 
Now, of course, on the one hand, they wanted the revenue. You know, this is going to be the best year we've ever, ever had. On the other, they simply could not meet the demand of the Swedish clientele. So IKEA did something funny. They said, drive to the depot and pick up your furniture. Right? Problem solved. However, strategy, solution equals new problem. Some conscientious Swede must have said, but they'll be driving all day, and when they get here, they'll be very hungry. And then somebody else said, meatball and chips. <laughs> and thus, the very famous IKEA restaurant and cafe was produced almost instantaneously. And so was the shop, because now it became a depot, somewhere you could go, and they made it nice. So the story of IKEA is one of an ever-changing, dynamic process. More formally, it's an emergent strategy, and I would argue that all strategies are emergent. We fast forward a little bit from the 70s to 1983, and we have Mintzberg emergent strategy. There's some key components here we need to understand. Your intentions, what you think, what you want to achieve. This is your intended strategy, requires cognition. This becomes your deliberate strategy. However, as time passes, new ideas emerge. Uh, as you take actions, you discover new insights, you have better ideas. These emerging strategies form into the stream of the deliberate strategy to give you, at some point, a realized strategy. There's three key elements you need to understand in this. The first one is it requires intelligence of some sort, cognition, in order to come up with your intended strategies. But the second thing you need is an open mind. Because if you don't have an open mind, then your new ideas, your emerging strategies, will never join into the stream. But you also need good judgment in order to discard your intentions, as well as integrating your newest ideas. Um, these are the three core elements of this strategy. Now, just because strategy is emergent does not mean it will emerge. Uh, a flower, when you plant it, it's, you know, it emerges from the ground unless you stand on it. Right? So just because you know, plant life is emergent doesn't mean it will emerge if you don't create the right conditions. It is possible, and I've seen this, this happens in, I suppose, a bit more authoritative organisations, where people's intentions become their deliberate strategy and they get exactly what they want. And yet they're left with a feeling of this is not quite right, a failed strategy. And that's because the blockages to the emergent strategies. Some people are very, very stubborn. When they say we're going to do this, they will do this to the bitter end. As King Lear said, some people would rather burn the world than change. What are these impediments? What are these things that block strategy emerging? So... At Container Solutions, now, of course, there are many things that stop strategy. But in our observations, in usually medium-sized and large organisations, but also within, within our own organisations, because you know, we're keep capable of you know, looking at what we're doing, you see that there are these three key impediments. Leadership, infrastructure, and the way you finance your projects. On top of that, these three interact with each other. There's a dynamic at play. Now, leadership starts with the key problem of ideology. We each of us have a set of beliefs, right? Roughly speaking, very roughly, people in management or on leadership teams, or actually throughout your organization, there are other planners who like to plan, think ahead. You can consider them map makers. My wife's a bit of a planner, so if we were going on holiday, she would want to know where's the connecting flight and what happens if we miss it. Now, on the other side, you have the emergers, the agilistas. These people are more intuitive. They just sort of play it by ear. They turn up to Bangkok with a backpack, and they figure it out from there. I was in a meeting once at a big business, and I sat there talking about strategy. And after 20 minutes, 25 minutes, it started to dawn on me. Everybody in the management team who was a planner was sat on one side of the table. And everybody who was into emergence or more intuition was sat on the other side of the table. The schism in the leadership team was felt throughout the whole company. Now, typically, when you've got an ideology or a set of beliefs, what you normally do is dismiss it. You know, I'm not, you know, that's not, you know, you ignore it, ignore it, ignore it, until you, until you can no longer ignore it, and then you dismiss it. 
We've seen this phenomenon with containers, lots of people in operations just ignoring it until they started to fight back and sort of dismiss it as you know, nonsense, not usable, not ready for production. Yeah, but our experiences tell us something else. So the, the key problem then is this. F. Scott Fitzgerald said, the test of a first-rate mind is to be able to hold two competing ideas in your head whilst, remain, whilst maintaining the ability to function. Does anybody have a boss who's got a first-rate mind? So there are not many first-rate minds out there. So ultimately, we've got to sort of solve this paradox ourselves. And often surfacing in it and acknowledging it, that there are two ways of thinking, planning and emergence, deliberation, and that in order for your strategy to work, you need to accommodate both. So having the conversation is often enough to sort of overcome this one. The second thing is about infrastructure, but I don't want to talk too much about infrastructure because we've had like two days of that. I want to talk about these monkeys instead. So the, <laughs> the, there's a famous experiment. Now, I don't know if it's now an urban legend or if it's really true. The experiment goes something like this. A load of scientists, researchers at MIT, they got a few monkeys and they chucked them in a cage. And then they locked the cage with a trapdoor and then they electrified the trapdoor. Of course, the first thing the monkeys tried to do was escape. The first one would go up, get electrocuted, come back down. The second one would try, get electrocuted and come back down. After they'd all been shocked and learned that there was no escape from this thing, the researchers started putting in new monkeys. Now, what would happen is the monkeys who had previously been shocked would stop the other monkey climbing to the top of the cage. You know, monkeys are like humans. You know, they're em empathic. Um, and then the, the researchers put a fifth monkey in and then a sixth monkey. And then the horrible people that they were, they started to take the original monkeys out. Now, at one point, none of the monkeys in the cage had ever been electrocuted. You drop another one in and they would all stop it from going to the trapdoor. And then the researchers turned the electricity off. So there was a path to freedom for the monkeys that they never, ever took. Now, this is how culture is, is sort of disseminated vertically between peers and horizontally between generations. The relation this has to infrastructure is as follows. We've all had accidents, machines that have been broken, things that have blown up. And our first instinct is to sort of say to ourselves, that's never going to happen again. So we start to build processes around our systems, or we build systems of control around our systems. And then we take pride in that this thing will never happen again. Then the person looking after the system leaves, brings in a new person, and then that person's told, this can never happen again, this is your job. Third person, fourth person, until at some point nobody actually knows why these processes can't be touched. Adrian Cockcroft calls this organisational scar tissue. So we've got all this infrastructure, we're not sure what it does, but we're scared to touch it. So infrastructure, it's hard for strategy to emerge when all of your energies go on fixing and maintaining your infrastructure, essentially when you've got a culture of patching and not a culture of systematically removing the scar tissue. Now, the third impediment to me is to do with finance. Um, We've probably all been on projects, although I must admit I'm, I'm really, really quite old. Uh, I was 40 in the summer. And in this business, this is old, right? Because some of the people in my company in their 20s, they do, we don't even speak the same language. Uh, and one of them calls me the old man. Uh, and, it, and I feel old. It makes me feel old. Um, back in the day when I was a developer, we all knew we should start with a continuous integration or continuous delivery script. We knew we should do it on day one. I wanted to do it, most of the people didn't. You know you should do it, but you don't do it. Now, six weeks into the project, and you don't do it because it takes a team of five people like two weeks, and you can quickly do the math, and you say, well, that's 25K, just to automate the build, we're not doing it. Six weeks later, you realize you should have automated the build back then, because you'd have saved more money. Ah, but you know, you're halfway through the project now, and so you don't do it. So I always think it's funny that companies and teams can never afford to do it right, but they can always afford to do it again. Uh, so <laughs> what's actually happening when you invest in infrastructure and code and scripts? You're taking the knowledge of your team, you're 
codifying it, and you're embodying the knowledge in the script. So actually, you're transferring knowledge from one place to another. Once the knowledge is transferred into a piece of code, you can then continually rinse value out of it. So what's actually happening is the innate human nature to discount the future. We all know we shouldn't smoke and drink because when we're in our 60s, we'll be more healthier. But nobody cares in this room. We discount the future. And the further the future is, the more we discount it. But we do that on the smallest levels. We know we should have a meeting on Monday morning just to see how everybody's feeling. But, you know, we don't do it. We know we should put the continuous build together, but we don't do it. So it's not money per se. Organisations love to waste money. Uh, none more than container solutions. Uh, but it's the spending habits, it's the way you spend. And actually, if you don't understand that, then this is a bit of a blocker. Now, the key blocker actually is the interplay between the three. If you've got weird spending habits, if you don't invest, that leads to weak infrastructure. Your top team gets pulled into middle management. Your middle management gets pulled into coordinating the weak infra. The infrastructure itself becomes like a dark center. You may have first-rate minds in your organization, but you would never actually know because they would be too busy patching these systems. What can we do about it? What are the solutions to these impediments? So the first solution, or the first solution we like, is to do with balancing responsibility and duty. We do that with what we call the donut principle. This is an American donut. There's not a European one. There's a hole in the middle. Do you have holes in your donuts? Yeah? No? It's, OK, so this is an American donut. The, <laughs> the, do <laughs> the donut is meant to, it's a conceptual idea. It's a very simple idea. It's meant to teach you to balance your duties, your core responsibilities, with a wider, uh, your core duties with a wider responsibility. If you're the CEO of a company, you have a wider responsibility to your team and to society and to pay your taxes and things like this. If you're a developer, you have a wider responsibility to coach your colleagues, help out, debug, refactor. So it's good enough to take a whiteboard, sketch a donut, fill in what you think your core job description is, and work out the space around that. Google tried to formulate, formalize the donut principle with the 20% rule, but the whole point is we need to know what our core duty is and we need to know what our space is. It starts to go really wrong when you have a donut that is too full. I was raised as a Roman Catholic. Um, we went to church, I went to Catholic schools, I had Catholic parents, Catholic aunties. There were lots and lots of rules. And unfortunately, there wasn't much space for us to express ourselves. In a system with lots of rules, people express themselves by breaking the rules, by smoking, by taking the Lord's name in vain, or whatever it is you do to sort of kick back against the system you're in. Once I went to university, my donut was restored. However, I discovered this again 10 years later when I was working in the finance industry. And what you see is people in finance, their donuts are so full with extra rules for compliance, line management responsibilities, that they use or they express their autonomy by fighting each other, by blocking each other. So donuts that are too full will always eat up the space where your emerging strategies are meant to rise up. I met an architect once, a software architect, not a real one. Um, <laughs> and he said to me, developers are so stupid. They're so stupid, this is what we do. I create the frameworks. I create all these abstract classes. It was, we were working in Java. Policies, strategies, uh, and all the stupid developers do are extend the abstract classes and fill in the method. I've even got a code and an analyzer to make sure they don't add any extra methods uh, because they're so stupid. And I said to him, how's that working out for you? Dickhead. <laughs> uh, now a dickhead in strategy is somebody who interferes with something which isn't theirs to interfere with. But there's the dickhead dynamic as well. What happened is, 
Because this architect had taken all the space for the developers to express themselves, they actually did perform poorly, thus strengthening his belief that they were all stupid, thus changing his beyond pushing him to do more frameworks and more abstract classes. And the more he did that, the more the developers resented him, and the dynamic stayed the same. Now, the alternative is an empty donut. Large organisations, last year we went to a large organisation, and the people there, the developers, I was so jealous. I was so jealous. They were running. Hey, I sounded like Donald Trump. I was so jealous. I do jealousy. Whew. Anyway, sorry. I probably sounded like Donald Trump in my head. Uh, not to you, to you lot. Um, I don't know where I am. Uh, empty donut. Went to this company. They were building everything, their own container system, their own orchestrator, because they thought they could do a better job than Google. Uh, and I was like, what's going on here? And it's because nobody cared. Management didn't care. They checked in on them. No product backlogs, no direction. It was all emergence with no direction. So empty donuts equal chaos. Uh, they don't work either. So the, the, in summary, as far as the donut's concerned, it's a conceptual way to combine your real duties to your larger responsibility. We need to create space for autonomy, otherwise new ideas will never emerge. So the next idea that we like at Container Solutions, and you know, our customers like as well, is this. People are scared. People are scared to spend money. So the reason they procrastinate on the continuous delivery build is because they're thinking, well, that's two weeks of my 12-week project gone. So they get, they get nervous, they get anxious. Or they're scared to do random things. But we also know that the lifeblood of a tech company and the lifeblood of technology companies is knowledge. And once we have knowledge, it becomes a question of how do we exploit it, but also how do we generate it? So what I encourage people to do, because the other thing is, by the way, in the two weeks that you're procrastinating about writing a new library, you could have written the library. So the cost of waiting is often more than the cost of actually doing it. So I try to get people to write things, blogs, components, call people, take actions, not thinking too much. And I say, if it doesn't work out, you take what you've done, like on a piece of paper, you scrunch it up, and you chuck it in the fuck it bucket, right? We've got a big bucket in the Amsterdam office. It's just full of stuff that didn't work. The core reason we use the bucket is to unstick people, to get things moving. There's another reason. It's only a matter of time, especially in high tech, in innovation companies, it's only a matter of time before you're back in the bucket pulling out stuff that you put in there last week. This is how we generate knowledge, right? And it supports the donut principle because if there's enough autonomy and there's enough freedom, and the anxiety is low, then these buckets should be getting nice and full. It'll only be a matter of time before we're back in there taking ideas out. Now, finding balance with yourself. We've spoken about strategy, but we haven't spoken about the strategist yet. We started to notice archetypes on our travels. So the, sort of, the, the, the dream archetype is this one. The strategist who has an understanding of current reality, uh, has empathy, speaks for the group, the strategist claims he or she represents, has a voice, because they need to you know, form coalitions, imagination in order to think of this bright future. The strategist will drag everybody from the current state to the new state. I, did, I showed this to a load of business people, and I said, is there anybody here who considers themselves to be like this? Three people confidently put their hands up. Um, Strategy does include self-awareness as a component. So nobody, nobody fits this profile. Hardly anybody fits this profile. A much more common archetype is this, the fantasist. Now, the fantasist is a funny one. I, we identified it early, quite early, right? And the fantasist has an imagination, has a voice. And the higher you are in a hierarchy, the deeper and bigger your voice. Some of the visions are their own. Some of them are stolen from other people. Usually Adrian Cockroft. You know, the fantasists go, they see Adrian speak, and then they come back, and they say, we're going to do microservices, and we're going to do highly available systems. We are going to become the Netflix of the Netherlands. 
And I say, that's funny. Because they stream videos and you're a bank. I started to get to the roots of the fantasist. What do you do when you have... It took me ages. It took me ages to work this out. What do you do when you're having a bad day? You project into the future, going home to see your wife, or in Michael's case, having a beer. In my case as well. Uh, you think about the evening. If it's a really bad week, you think about the weekend. Some of us think about retirement. <laughs> when you're having a tough time, you project yourself into the future. So the fantasies come when they're really in difficult, awful situations. The passive aggression that you find in large organisations because people's donuts are full, this is where the fantasies come from. The other people, the people who put their hand up in that meeting when I said, are you a strategist? Yeah, I'm a strategist. They're actually fantasists. That's how I diagnose the fantasists in the organisations, by asking them if they're a strategist. And if they say yes, then I know they're not. And if they don't say they are, then I also know they're not. It's like that old thing in the old days. You remember how you would discover a witch in your village. You would drown her, and if she died, she wasn't a witch. And if she lived, you'd kill her because she was a witch. Uh, but, you know, it's, it was tough in the old days. <laughs> the, does anybody recognize this archetype? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, this is common. Now, the angry engineer is often credible. He's often the go-to person for people who need things fixing, massive empathy, fully understands the group they claim to represent, often a voice as well. They do understand reality, they under understand the organisational scar tissue, they understand that microservices are a result of an emergent strategy. They were not the strategy, they were the results of a thought process, but the angry engineer, or there's a part of reality the angry engineer doesn't understand. It's the part where people don't like to be shouted at. And so angry engineers struggle to form coalitions with managers. And no matter how much you like management or how little you like management, management is power. So, is there any hope for us? Well, actually, the hope lies in this. If you merge the fantasist, excuse me, if you merge the fantasist with the angry engineer, you start to get something that looks like a strategist. This is why CEOs always come with CTOs. This is how it works. Okay, so coming to some conclusions. Um, is there a, how are we doing for time? Oh, yeah. Sorry? I can't believe it. Did you see when it came up? Okay, we'll check on the video later. I think it was... <laughs> I think it was 20 minutes. Um, so we can start to draw some conclusions from all of this work and all of our experiences. The, the first thing would be this. 100% deliberate strategy actually leaves no room for learning. Uh, and we know that technology and tech, you know, rolling technologies out is part of a continuous learning cycle. Uh, but at the same time, 100% emergent strategy there's no control. So this is one of the key things I'd like you to take away today because it's understanding that somewhere in between those extremes, 100% control and 100% uh, emergence, lies the solution to the problems we're facing. The, the key strategic question should always be, what's going on here? It should never be, where are we going to uh, what is our vision for the future, but rather what is our current condition? Ultimately, strategy is not really about a utopian vision. It's about understanding the current state and moving to a new and better state. If your organisation takes six weeks to release its software, you don't need to think about Spotify and Netflix. You need to try to get your release cycle down from six weeks to five weeks and then from five weeks to four weeks. If you work at a university that's in the middle of the league tables, you shouldn't aspire to become the Harvard of Germany. You should probably just fix your English department, right? So it's understanding about where you are and where the potential next move could be. And then finally, um, this one. The strategist 
is three people. An outside man, somebody who understands the market, understands trends. As soon as the infrastructure in your company, the processes in the team stop working, the outside man becomes an inside man, starts looking inwards. The strategist is a, is a man of thought. It's about cognition, it's about planning, it's about vision. But for some reason, we have become deluded that the whole of strategy is about thought. That everything is about thinking and five force analysis. If you do an MBA, has anybody done an MBA? Oh, poor man, how was it? Actually, good. You're doing it right now? Have you done the strategy module? Did you do Michael Potter's five force analysis? Yeah, you try to forget that now. Right? It's like seeing Donald Trump naked. You, <laughs> you cannot unremember that shit. Michael Porter, five force analysis. This is how it works. You take a business like IKEA and you do the five force analysis on it. The customer segmentation, the competitors, the geographical relation, all of that stuff. And your analysis would tell you this. Uh, IKEA is a... Uh, uh, price competitive, it targets a customer segment that's you know, got some cash but not too much. IKEA also has a prosumer model. You know? We think about prosumerism as being a new thing. Prosumerism is where you consume something whilst you're producing it. YouTube is a classic example. We produce videos to upload and we consume them later on. Uh, I'm always watching my own videos when I go home. Um, IKEA is the perfect, is the, is, the, is the classic prosumer model. The manufacturing process is finished in your house, right? So they externalise the cost of manufacture to the actual clients. Not only did they do that, but they tricked you into enjoying the process. So people are like, oh, I love IKEA, I get to paint this bit red, and it's like, it fulfils this need for creativity. Which, if you work in a bank with a full donut, makes sense, right? Imagine if your only pleasure at work is dreaming about Saturday when you could have meatballs and build some fucking furniture, right? <laughs> this is the reality for many people in tech. My wife will be watching this video thinking, oh, that's me. I, I like Ikea. Uh, <laughs> if, if, you asked, if, this is, if you're watching this, Andrea, hi. Uh, um, so, five force analysis. So, Michael Potters would tell you all of these things about Ikea. However, let's do the same analysis on Netflix. What do Netflix do? Oh, they have microservices, they're highly available, they continually deliver them. This, does, this analysis does not point to a strategy. When we start a new business, you don't sit down and say, oh, container solutions will operate in this space and our customer will be this, because we don't know. The only way to discover that is to interact with the market. So the analysis will prove or will show you your results. It's retrospective coherence. It tells you the end of the strategic process, but it doesn't give you any hints at all how to go ahead and build it. People like Michael Potter have dominated strategy in business for the last 20 years, and yet if you look at business in the last 20 years, most of the strategy has been complete shit. So something's going wrong. So the MBA gentleman just... Did you look at Mintzberg? Take a look at Mintzberg and then, you know might help you. <laughs> Strategy's got nothing to do with, an M with MBAs. It's got much more to do with the heroic, entrepreneurial warriors of Greek times. Don't waste your time, in my opinion, reading business books. Read the classics. Marcus Aurelius, a bit of Greek history. Odysseus changed over time. When he, when he, when, when he went from being Odysseus to Ulysses, they changed him. He was a, he was a hero in Greek uh, mythology, but in Roman mythology, he was seen as sneaky and not very nice. So, we need to take actions. And then ultimately, this, this model I grabbed, I think there's a guy, Daniel Pink, and he sort of did a study of modern motivation. In our experience, the only thing that develops new systems are motivated teams, people who actually want to change stuff. And if you look at my strategic model, and if you look at the donut, you start to see why this might work. Old states and new states, by definition, you're mastering something else. You're mastering new skills, you're mastering the emergent strategy process itself. The donut creates autonomy, your deliberate strategy creates purpose. 
Now, modern psychology is telling us what Marcus Aurelius already knew thousands of years ago is that these three things compound to create highly motivated teams. And so I've come to think that strategy done right is exciting, exhilarating, and respectful to the people trying to do it, and ultimately highly motivating. Thank you. So, uh, Windows Update has finished meanwhile. Um, <laughs> Jamie has finished his talk, but we have left some time for questions and I think some interesting answers. So, is anybody ready for a question? Mustn't, mustn't be on a, doesn't just, have to be on a very strategic level. Just to bribe you, I've got three copies of Adrian's Docker book in German. And anybody who asks a question can have one. <laughs> We can't, we, we can't sell them. We can't even give them away. No. <laughs> just, just kidding. Just to explain, Adrian, he's an employee of Container Solutions, and he wrote a book on Docker, which has been translated into German. And this is the German version. Nobody wants So we it. have a uh, first here. question here. <laughs> um, how to, uh, to identify the necessary people for a company? If you identified the strategists, which are Where's fantasists. Yeah. Um, how to find the real people you need in this position? Um, that's a good question. So, how, so just let me paraphrase that if anybody uh, didn't hear it or for the stream, for those watching at home. How do you find the right people to um, uh, build your company and build a good team? So usually by a little bit of trial and error. So my co-founder at Container Solutions, Pini Resnick, I'd worked with him previously but I'd worked with many other people. In a way, he's the CTO in the sense he's the, I wouldn't say he's an angry engineer, but he'd taken a lot of experience from operations uh, at TomTom Tom where he worked. He understood that space very well. Uh, and I took the role of CEO because I had some ideas about taking the extreme programming practices and applying them against the cloud. So I'm an old XPA. I was into test-driven development. And as an experiment, I sort of was thinking, how can we do that? against this sort of new world of AWS and cloud computing that was emerging at the time. But the truth is, is that we had a two-year period where we worked together. That was a difficult period. And our friendship or our bond was sort of formed within fire. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing, companies really, f and they fuck this up beyond comprehension. They say, we're all a family. We're a family here. Well, you know, I would divorce my family if I could. You know, my, you know, my family from back in England because they're all really annoying, right? And you set different standards for your family. You forgive them easily. Uh, you know, you do stuff for them. You enable their bad behavior. Businesses are not families. They're high-performing sports teams. Now, the way to achieve that is to have a trial period, uh, you know, two or three months where people work together. You do as much, you know, difficult work as you can. You hope that there's a crisis because crisis really reveals people. And then over time, you systematically build your team up. You give presentations like this, which will attract those who are drawn to your mission, but it will repel other people. And you have to be patient. We have a great team at CS, but wow, it's been difficult to uh, uh, pull together. Actually, Michael will be speaking after me about orchestration. The Swiss team are awesome, but it's taken two years of getting to know each other to put that little team together. So patience, diligence, and you know, crisis. Thank you. Change for the microphone. You get your book. Oh, you get a book, yeah. First book. Congratulations. Yes. So another candidate. So we have two more here. We'll come to you. Don't worry. Um, I'm working as a product manager, and when I see this definition of the strategies, it's really similar. And wanted to ask your experience because there's always like the kind of two ambitions like to think in a strategic way and really be hands-on uh, manage the product backlog and so on mm -hmm. how do you actually find the right balance for this and would you actually do this in two different persons would you always enforce one person having the whole picture and how do you achieve this in reality so the question is he's a your product manager and you're trying to build a product and he wants to uh, think strategically and i guess also strategically about the product but he also has to do hands-on stuff like create stories, acceptance tests, and you know, gather information from people. Well, this is, 
this is everybody's dilemma. So this is not just a dilemma for product managers, it's a dilemma for engineers too. Too many programmers spend all of their time with their headphones on, coding away, take perspective. They should do that. The best programmers do that. So the question could probably be reframed, how do we come up for air and how do we look around? The first thing is to acknowledge it. Think about your donor, right? So your strategic thought can be done in your outer rim. Look at your product owner role. What is it you do, specifically in the core of the donut? Now, what don't you like? Because you should always delegate what you don't like, right? And I'm not joking. Delegate what you don't like. Then, as your team's capabilities grow, you then have to do something else. You have to delegate what you do like. Because if I'm great at sales, I'm not, by the way, but you know, just for argument's sake, and I take the sales function at Container Solutions, I leave no space for the next person to come. The growth of the business is thus restricted by my own you know, greatness in sales. So think about that. Delegate what you hate, later delegate what you're good at, and drop all the bullshit. I guarantee there's like two, three, four hours in your week that's complete bullshit. Speaking to people you can't stand, uh, pulled into compliance meetings, and, but if you don't have any of that, work 42 hours instead of 40, and in the two hours go for a big, long walk. Every single thinker from Nietzsche to, you know, like strategic thinker, they all walk. They all go for walks. It does something to you. Heart starts pumping, you get a rhythm, ideas start to come. Thank you. Does it answer the question? Yeah, it was a great answer. <laughs> okay. Do you, want, do you want a book? <laughs> so, co coalition building. Strategies about coalition building, about building bridges. Give that to an engineer you don't like, <laughs> right? <laughs> Build them bridges. Uh, So, after all this, uh, how often do you use your basket? Well, uh, I'm afraid all the time. Sometimes, <laughs> uh, all the time, we're learning all the time. I had a, I had a meeting with my, a shareholder of Container Solutions this week, which was difficult. I got some feedback. So, I, we didn't exactly go in the bucket, but we were able to look back over the last few months. That was confrontational. Uh, the team at Container Solutions are experimenting all the time. I mean, we, we, they created the mini Mesos uh, 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 testing tool. It runs basically Apache Mesos on your laptop. It's an amazing piece of kit, right? That sort of just came out of a weird annoyance and a suspicion that it could be used for continuous delivery. Uh, Frank, our colleague, started building it, and before we knew it, it became a thing. Uh, so the book, it's full. It's just full of lots and lots of stuff. And we encourage people to go to conferences, uh, Sometimes the, do the, the donut's a bit small. Sometimes there's a bit of chaos in CS. Um, but after two years, there's a lot of stuff in there. Frameworks, books, 10, 20 customers, training courses, essays, lots of talks like this that turned out to be not very good. So they go in the bucket. Um, but then later I find myself taking something out. Oh, that was quite a good joke. Or that was a good metaphor. They're pretty full. Do you want a book? I get third book, and we put. I feel a bit bad because this gentleman up here had his hand up. We. Ah, okay. What was the question? <laughs> right. Yeah. So a good a good strategic leader will teach or help uh, the people below them or who are working with them to define their core duties, and then will always create space. Any leader who's not having conversations is, you know, is not really doing their job. Another thing about coalition building, by the way, this is a good one. People naturally reciprocate. We have empathy, and empathy is the core of connection and compassion, but it's also the core of deception, right? The best deceivers are the ones with the most empathy. If there's somebody you can't build a bridge with or you can't stand, ask them to do you a favor, because once they've helped you, they'll start saying to themselves, oh, he's not so bad, that, that guy, because they have to justify the help they gave you. So that's a way to turn enemies into friends. I've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you can have the book without asking a question. Yeah. And we have a fourth question. Oh, you have w a question. Worth a fourth book. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, I think I live in a, or work in an environment where we are, have full donuts, uh, so to speak. Yeah. And I'm not sure how to, uh, how can I help my, my colleagues and, uh, and the people in my team 
uh, to change the destructive behavior, the kickback, uh, breaking the rules, blocking each other, into a constructive, uh, emptying the donut action. Because from upside, everyone says it has to be that way. We have to have defined roles and mm -hmm. huge documents on each one. How, how do I change that? Okay, so, so the, the full donor and the passive aggression, that resonates with you? Yes, um, yeah, unfortunately. And then the question is, how can you change it? How big is your team? Um, my team is yeah. four people, but the company is about 500. Yeah, okay. I mean, so that's, so my, my short answer would be, just get another job. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thanks for the advice. <laughs> yeah, that would, that, would, that would be my short answer. You, we, we, are each of us, we are each of us not on this planet for a very long time. Everybody in this room is hugely blessed. Uh, sometimes we're, we're blinkered, we, you know, we're spoiled a little bit in tech because we are so easy, to, to, so easy to change jobs. And even the worst of our jobs are quite fun. I mean, there are people out there who really work for a living, you know, in difficult situations. You're only going to be under 40 like once. So don't waste any of it on somebody else's bullshit. Too late. Uh, okay, well, you're only going to... Well, 50 is the new 40. Uh, so don't waste it on... But if you've truly found a company that's worth fighting for, if you really want to stay and fight, the, the, the cornerstone is the coalition, right? There's a paper online where I did extreme programming for performance testing. Now, it's from 10 years ago, but if you reread it, the world has changed so much, it's, it looks like it's from the 1880s, you know. But the point is, I remember on that project, I was only in my 20s at the time, and everybody hated each other, full donuts, compliance, you name it. And I did something which was weird. I took, I went to the performance testing people who were in a different department and building, of course, and I spent six weeks trying to be, get friends with them. Six weeks, right? And then I asked them for a favour, can you, if I do this, can you do that? And that's when I first saw it. And so when people say to me, you want me to work on this for six weeks? And I'm like, well, well, yeah. And at Container Solutions, we've been building our coalition for two years. And so people underestimate it. They just want to go there to say to somebody, stop being a dick, change my role, deploy my stuff, done. It doesn't work like that. The, the path to success is extremely difficult and painstaking. We're bad at it when we're developing because our world is a world of instant gratification uh, and the world of strategy is about delayed gratification. That's, that's one of the core dynamics that makes it hard. Thank you. Question? Oh. I think that's it. Uh, thank you so much also for the conference and for the cool questions. <laughs>